of part six, it says miniature Bible. We have spoken about this before. The book of Isaiah has been called the miniature Bible because of its content. There are 66 chapters. There are 66 books in the Bible. The book of Isaiah, like the Bible, records the rise and fall of God's people, Israel. So we know that from the Old Testament, it is about the history of Israel and the blessing of the millennial kingdom, the reign of Christ, the Messiah. So the first um, 39 chapters is about judgment and about the judgments upon the nations and also Israel. And then the last part is about the restoration of the land, very much like the Bible uh, entails in the same way. Old Testament, 39 chapters, 27, chap uh, 27 books in the New Testament. Okay, it says multiple fulfillment. We also spoke about this before. Too often we forget that the Bible was written to an Oriental audience. Uh, above Oriental, just put Middle East. In case you get confused with China, because we often talk about the Orient as being in China. But Oriental, yeah, is if you look at the, a map and you divide it in half, if you look at Africa in the front, if you divide it in half, it will be the East and the West. All right, so the Western part, we normally talk about Europe and we talk about America, obviously. They like the Western thought. Middle East down to China is what we call Oriental, the Eastern thoughts. All right, so the Bible is written to the Oriental audience, which will be a Middle Eastern audience. The Jews live in Israel. Notwithstanding the universal relevance of the book, from a Western or Occidental, Occidental as opposed to Oriental, this is now, let's say, America, viewpoint, a prophecy or prediction anticipates a single fulfillment. So according to our minds and people in America, if we talk about prophecy, it has one fulfillment. For example, if I predicted the 9-11 terror or uh, the assassination, uh, attempted assassination of Trump, did we all see that? I'm sure we did, yeah. <laughs> if I predicted that, um, there would be one prophecy and one fulfillment. But according to the Middle Eastern people, according to Orients, their prophecies can have multiple fulfillments. So it can be fulfilled now and in 10 years' time and again in 20 years' time and in 100 years' time. Okay, multiple fulfillments. Um, in contrast, Hebrew readers view prophecy in its multiple fulfillment. Uh, a good example of this is found in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 7, with regards to Emmanuel. Isaiah predicts that there will be a person called Emmanuel, and when he grows up, the invasion will happen with Assyria. And that did happen. So it had a prediction, and the fulfillment did take place in the time of Isaiah. And also we know that the prophecy of Emmanuel also was fulfilled at the time of Jesus. When Jesus was born, he became our Emmanuel. Multiple fulfillments. And we see that especially also with the restoration of Israel. When they were taken into exile in Babylon, the prediction was that they would be restored to the land, which they were. They came back and they lived in the land. But also through the ages, they were dispersed again, called the Diaspora. They were dispersed all over the world. And then 1948, they started to come back to the land again. Multiple performance. All right. Any questions? You guys are awesome. This fact is particularly indiscernible when one considers that although Isaiah addressed Judah and Israel, at his time and predicted their fall and restoration, he also was referring to a future day when the Messiah would come and the day of the Lord of judgment would follow before his kingdom is restored to Israel. So they have been restored, but the future complete fulfillment of Israel will only take place in the millennial kingdom. All right, so a lot of their restoration has happened. The Jews have come back. The land has been bountiful and beautiful, but not complete yet. In the millennial kingdom, when Jesus comes to return and sit on the throne of Israel, then it will be completely fulfilled. So over the page, we're going to read about Daniel's prophecy. Page two, right at the top, it says, Daniel was exiled to Babylon. Babylon is modern-day Iraq. Uh, we spoke about that earlier, me and Nick, ISIS, Iraq, Syria, and was part of the Jewish remnant that survived in a foreign land. God used Daniel to foretell the rise and fall of empires as he unpacked Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So we spoke about that, I think, in a bit of detail in this lesson, in the lessons of Daniel, and in the sermon series on the book of Daniel. Daniel, like Isaiah, predicted the national restoration of the rise, national restoration of Israel, and the rise. So just put there, national restoration of Israel. Sorry, just put that in there somewhere. National restoration of Israel. And the rise of the man of sin, the Antichrist. And I don't, uh, it's actually just interesting to think of this assassination attempt on Trump and, and how that will affect the politics in America, politics of the world, 
and what's going to happen here. Uh, because this is obviously going to be pushing what I understand, pushing him to become president in, in a way. This is a seal, his presidency. And if he does become president, then how will this affect his relations with Israel, Gaza, things like that, in relation to the Antichrist coming here? Um, and the Antichrist, many people believe, will might be a Muslim. He, he'll probably be a Muslim from the Middle Eastern countries, an Arab, with um, historical Jewish roots. Because he has to make peace between the Jews and the Arabs. So the only way the Jews would accept him, if he can actually have credentials to show that he is actually Jewish, but I personally believe, and some scholars believe that he'll probably be from the Muslim territories. Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, I don't think Saudi Arabia, but those territories. All right, both Daniel and Isaiah recognize the media Persian monarch, Cyrus or Cyrus, as a servant in God's plan to restore the Jewish people. A study of the book of Daniel, Revelation, unveils the fate of nations and the dominance of Israel. When it talks about Cyrus, we spoke about him, it was predicted in uh, chapters 48 and 49. And this was predicted uh, 150 years before Cyrus even came on the, on the scene. And this was a, a king and a prince of media Persia, and he was actually very lenient to the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar was a real tyrant, a horrible man of Nebuchadnezzar. So he kept the Jews enslaved in Babylon, but when Cyrus took over, he actually started sending them back to the homeland. He said, go back to your homeland, rebuild. And not only that, he actually gave them finances and resources to do that. Because he was kind of a good guy. Um, so if we're going to quickly read this part in the black. See that black insert there? That's quite nice to read because of archaeology. And um, if you read the Bible, you know, this, it's been attacked through the centuries and ages about not being uh, historically correct and archaeologically correct and scientifically correct. And the truth is that time after time, archaeology and history actually prove that the Bible is true and correct. For the, the one biggest one that I always like is Pontius Pilate. For centuries, people believe that Pontius Pilate was a fictitious, bless you, a fictitious character that uh, he wasn't in the Bible. There was no person like this until they actually found a monument with this guy's name on it in Latin, Pontius Pilatus. And, you know, so then the, then the historians and archaeologists say, oh, well, you know, maybe he did exist. And if he did exist, then maybe what the Bible says about him is true. All right. And they do that all the time. And this is one of the examples of Cyrus. So it says that in the 6th century, the 600 BC, Cyrus the Great of Persia conquered the Middle East and a large part of Asia. Uh, it was the whole Middle East from Greece down to Egypt, right up near to India. Upon his entry into Babylon, he freed the many captive people found there. He is, what is that word? Mag Magnimus. What? I don't, it was, it was, his big gesture liberated the Jewish nation and entitled her people to return to Jerusalem with the temple treasures and begin rebuilding Solomon's temple, destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. He spoke about that in one of the services on the temple. Um, so they rebuilt Nebuchadnezzar's temple. It wasn't as great in uh, majestic as that one. It was really, really plain and modest. It says, the prophet as I refer to Cyrus or Cyrus as the anointed by the Lord. In 1879, a clay record of Cyrus's decree was unearthed in the ruins of an ancient city of Babylon in Iraq. So just outside um, Baghdad, Baghdad is the capital of Iraq currently, just outside, a few miles away from Baghdad, are the actual ruins of Babylon. Actual ruins of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. And in there, they found this that little thing that you see at the top there. It's called the Cyrus Cylinder. No one today has a Cyrus Cylinder. This priceless account had been referred to as the first bill of rights. So they found that it spoke not only about Cyrus as being the uh, leader of the media Persians, but also told of him sending the Jews back to Jerusalem. So again, archaeology confirms what the Bible says. Which one? The magnanimous one. Big. <laughs> it means big. <laughs> or well, you can look it up on Google. But uh, yeah, I, I think it just means he's like big gesture. <laughs> Not too sure. Big generous gesture. There we go. Thank you. All right, so Cyrus is an important guy. He sent all the Jews back. And we read about that in Daniel. And also Isaiah predicted that. All right, then it, in the middle of the page it says God's appeal to Israel. In Isaiah 48, as he said, uh, as I said before, we're going through the book, like kind of chronologically and sequentially. So we last time we done 48, 49. So now we're on 48. It says, God's appeal to Israel, Isaiah 48. It says this, listen to me, Jacob, Israel, whom I have called. I am he. I'm the first and I'm the last. My own hand laid the foundations of the earth and my right hand spread 
out the heavens, when I summon them, they all stand up together. Come together, all of you, and listen. Which of the idols have foretold these things? Only God and his prophets could have foretold the accuracy of scripture. The Lord's chosen ally will carry out his purpose against Babylon. Their chosen ally is Cyrus. His arm will be against the Babylonians. He did. He actually conquered the Babylonians. I, even I, have spoken. Yes, I have called him. I will bring him, and he will succeed in his mission. This is talking about Cyrus. Come near me and listen to this. From the first announcement, I have not spoken in secret. At the time it happens, I am there. And it's interesting that God uses the, the enemy sometimes to fulfill his purposes. He done that with the, the Pharaoh in Egypt too. It was God that hardened his heart and, and then brought the plagues along. So God does, even Nebuchadnezzar, God used him and anointed him as that king. As vile and vicious as he was, God used him for his purposes. The same as Cyrus, he was not a Jewish person, he was an enemy. He was part of the media Persians, but he used him to fulfill his purpose. It might be actually what I heard. I'm not a political guy, but what I heard about Donald Trump again is that this could be part of God's purpose in, in something happening. I don't know. <laughs> I don't Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, as I said, I don't want to get into politics and, and pick sides. I mean, if you like Biden, good for you. I don't, it doesn't blow my hair back. Uh, but uh, uh, it could be something. I mean, when you see things like that happen, it kind of just makes you think, what, well, what's going to happen next? And, yeah. Yeah, Cyrus, yeah. yeah. Again, multiple fulfillment. All right. At the bottom, it talks about Jesus talking about Jerusalem, Matthew 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you. How often have I longed to gather your, chick, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And you were not willing. Looked, the house you left to you is desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus was actually saying they're predicting the desolation of Jerusalem, and it did actually take place. Uh, in 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. A second time now, first time was Nebuchadnezzar with Babylon, and then now with the Romans. And was left desolate for hundreds, thousands of years until 1948, till the Jews actually came back to their home. All right, any questions so far? Nothing. Very nice, easy lesson. Okay, on page three, as I said, we're going to do page three, and then we're going to finish there. And then next time, we're going to continue with Isaiah 53. On page three, right at the top, it talks about the Jewish Messiah. It says this in Isaiah 49. This is what the Lord says in the time of my favor, I will assure you. And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritance. It talks about restoration. It also talks about the coming Messiah. Jesus was called to come and be the king of the Jews. He said that from the beginning, from his birth, he predicted the kingdom to come and he was going to sit on that kingdom. Unfortunately, because of the rejection, though, that kingdom was held in abeyance and postponed. We know that. And then God ushered in the body of Christ, the church age, you and I. But that will still be fulfilled when Jesus does return in the second coming and does fulfill the role of king of the Jews. God divorces Israel. It says in Isaiah 50, this is what the Lord says. Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? To whom are creditors that I sell you? Because of your sins, you were sold. Because of your transgressions, your mother was sent away. In the Bible, especially Old Testament, Israel is referred to as the wife of God. And we often hear of the bride of Christ. Have you heard of that before? Yeah. Uh, and then what kind of people say is that in Old Testament, Israel was the wife of Christ. And in the New Testament, the church is the bride of Christ. And it sounds all right. It can be. But when it talks about the bride of Christ, in Revelation, it actually tells us who the bride is. And it says that the bride of Christ is actually the new Jerusalem. Very clearly stated. And I would rather stick with what the Bible says first before I jump to another opinion. We can be the bride of Christ also. I don't think it's unfair to say that we are. But I, I just want to keep, when it talks about God's relationship and covenant with Israel, it's a wife and a bride. All right? In the Old Testament and actually in the New Testament also. Um, and it talks about the divorce there because uh, of a rejection of him. And then it talks about in Isaiah 51, the land restored to Israel. It says, the Lord will surely comfort Zion. Zion is Israel. Zion is the mountain in Jerusalem. It covers up the whole land. 
a lot, a lot of it. And I will look with compassion on her ruins. He will make her deserts like Eden, back in the Garden of Eden. Her wastelands like a garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Again, this has been partially fulfilled already. The Jews have returned to Israel from 948, and their deserts have become a bountiful, blooming agricultural land, but not complete fulfillment yet. These things he's talking about the millennial kingdom, and it will be really like Eden. All right, so we do see a lot of that happening. If you've been to Israel, uh, uh, it's wonderful agricultural lands and grasslands, uh, but not complete fulfillment yet. In the millennial kingdom, it will. Sorry? They do. A real small fraction of the land. Well said. Yeah, if you ever want to, just go to Google, look at a map of Israel, and what it will show you is the middle part of Israel, the, the slither in the middle, is actually Israeli Jewish occupied territory. The rest of the land is occupied by Arabs. The Gaza Strip, the West Bank, the Golan Heights. And this is a big part of it. Half of the territory in Israel belongs to Arabs. So it's really, as um, Jack said, it's a slither of land in the middle that is there. That whole land will be blossoming like the Garden of Eden. All right, and then it says that um, right in the middle, restoration and comfort. Same thing, same idea, same ideology. Those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing everlasting joy with crown. Uh, will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them and sorrow and is that singing or sign? Sign, <laughs> sorry. Well, glass is back on. There we go. <laughs> sorrow and sign will flee away. Again, talking about the same area. In the millennial kingdom, they will return to the homeland, all of them, and it will be just like it was before. Isaiah 52 verse 6 says, Therefore my people will know my name. Therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yet, yes, it is I. All right, and then we're going to end on the last part, and then this is the part we're going to carry on into next week. The Messiah's reception, the first advent of Christ. In John 1, we'll actually be reading that in our Bibles. Uh, in 10 and 11, it says this, He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Who is, who is this talking about? Jesus. He came to that which is his own. He, was, he came and was born in Bethlehem in Israel to a Jewish mom in so he, was, he came of his own people, the Jews, but his own did not receive him. They, they did initially, a lot of people, a lot of the Jews did actually receive Jesus and accept him. But as he continues through the Gospels, you see that many of them fell away. Uh, at the end, he's actually left alone in the Garden of Gethsemane with uh, three of his favorites, and then they also run away also. So it starts actually good. He gets a big following, but as you carry on reading, when he starts talking more about discipleship and following him and carrying your cross, Many of the disciples start leaving, and he's left with a small handful of people at the end. The Jews, as a national entity, did not receive Jesus. Isaiah 53 describes the hostile reception of the Messiah by his people who failed to grasp the glorious moment of their time. Luke 19.42 says, If you, even you, and no one of this day, that will bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. If they just understood the magnitude, what's that word, that magnumous thing of what was happening at that time with Jesus coming in, saying that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. If, if they could just understand the gravity of that statement, but they didn't. They, they continued to reject him, eventually crucifying him and killing his disciples and apostles. At the end it says, please read this chapter, this is Isaiah 53, of our Lord's suffering and ask the simple question, who else? Could the prophet be referring to? But the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. So with that, let's turn to John. We're going to first start by John. And then we're just going to look at like chapter 53, but not read it. We are doing a sermon series in the church on the book of John. We've done the first four chapters, three chapters. So we're just going to read the first 11 verses of John chapter 1. Give you context to what was said there earlier. John, New Testament, reading from verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So God referring to the Father, Yahweh, Jesus is the Word. They were in the beginning. They co-equal, co-eternal. Not only was Jesus and Yahweh together, but Jesus, the Word, was God and is still. Praise the Lord God. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has not been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men.
the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And that's also referring to, it's obviously talking about Jesus as being the light of the world, but also a reference to Genesis as the light that comes. God said, let there be light over the darkness that was there. So John is actually referring to that Genesis account and just having a nice spiritual application to Jesus. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came to be a witness to testify concerning that light, and through him all men might believe. John was a witness. He was not the Messiah. He himself said, I am not he. I am not even worthy to tie his sandals or untie his sandals. He himself was not the light. He came to be a witness to the light, that light being Jesus. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own. Again, I said that's the Jewish people, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, gave them the right to become the children of God. And that's where we will end there. All right, so it's talking about Jesus Christ in his first advent. He came and he took on flesh. He became a babe in a manger. And his reason for that was to live like a man and ultimately to die. That's why Jesus came to the earth, to die. I know we, we, sometimes it's hard to fathom, but that was his purpose. That was his mission, to die for us, for the forgiveness of sins. So he was born to die, and not a death in vain. It was a death for the salvation of the world. All right, so you finish with John. Let's go to Isaiah 53. And as I said, we're not going to read it. This is a little bit of a homework for you. Even if you don't read it in this week, we will be doing this next week. So you still got at least two weeks to read. What I want to do there is just read like the first three verses. That's all. If you're on Isaiah 53, go to 52, and then I'm just going to go to uh, verse 13. And then I, I like the headings in the Bible. I like my Bible because it gives headings. It gives you context to what we're talking about. And the heading of that one, starting in 52 verse 13, says the suffering and glory of the servant. Has anybody else got a heading? Yours also. What is yours, sir? Sin bearing servant. All right, yeah. Again, and then uh, because it doesn't, there, there's no heading for chapter fifty three. I don't know. I, I don't have a heading. So and the the whole the whole context actually starts in fifty two verse thirteen, talking about this. But Isaiah fifty three itself is like the 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 main one. So what I want to do is uh, read just fifty three, just the first three verses, and then you can read the whole context. It says in uh, Isaiah chapter fifty three, it says, "Who has believed our message, and to whom?" As the arm of the Lord have been revealed, he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. I love that saying, just that phrase. And familiar with suffering, like from one who men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. And now the rest of that whole thing, and indeed, chapter 52, verses 13 onwards, talks about the suffering servant, the Messiah to come, that will go through atrocities and punishment and pain. By his stripes he were healed. It talks about all that he was pierced for our transgressions. This is all in chapter 53. And when you read it, it doesn't say anything about Jesus in there. Obviously, it won't have his name because Jesus is a man that he was given in the New Testament. But it talks about the Messiah to come and going through terrible stuff. And the details in there can only refer to Jesus Christ. Only. That's kind of what that last part says. Who else is this referring to but the Lord Jesus Christ? When you read Isaiah 53, and then put into your mind what Jesus Christ done in the Gospels and his death, they marry each other 100%. And the, the shame of this is that this Isaiah 53 is obviously a book in the Old Testament for the Jews as part of their uh, writings. And yet they don't see that Jesus fulfilled these verses. They're still waiting for their Messiah to come and somehow fulfill this. And the, it's already been done. Jesus already has done all of this here. So your homework will be, if you want to, for this week, is to read Isaiah 53. We will be doing the commentary next week anyway. So if you quickly look at your lesson, if you turn over to the page 4, it says an expose on Isaiah 53. And it just is basically a word-for-word -word commentary. There's not even too much to actually add value to because Isaiah 53 says it all. All right, there we go. So that's your homework for this week and where we are for next week. Any questions on the last couple of chapters of Isaiah? Not 53, just one prior to that.